I am really excited about my first guest today. That's going to be Grisha Stewart. She is the author of a number of books. She's an international speaker. She's a dog trainer who really specializes in reactivity. She is currently based in the Eugene, Oregon area, and she founded the online Animal Building Blocks Academy and the award-winning Ahimsa Dog Training in the Seattle, Washington area. Ahimsa is a, a, a Buddhist doctrine of nonviolence to all living things, which really reflects Grisha's focus on empowerment to promote the well-being of dogs and people. Uh, in, her, uh, in her book that we're going to talk about a little bit today, uh, Behavioral Adjustment Training 2.0, The New Practical Techniques for Fear, Frustration, and Aggression, it's a great update to her, her, her BAT protocol. Um, and uh, she also covers a wide range of training strategies there. Also, she has another book that came out a while back. It's the uh, uh, Ahimsa Dog Training Manual, A Practical Force Degree Guide to Problem Solving and Manners, which is really a, a really nice, nice book. And of course, if you're interested in the BAT protocol, she put out a, a six DVD series uh, um, on BAT 2.0, and we'll probably talk about some of those things as well. Uh, I'm really glad that Grisha could join us on live from the ranch today. Hi, Grisha. How are you? Oh, I'm great, Ken. Thank you so much for having me on here. It's a huge honor. You're one of my personal heroes, so always well, good. I appreciate, I, I'm so, that's so kind of you to say. I've always enjoyed your, uh, your work. Um, we have not crossed paths professionally very often, but those times that we have, I think we crossed paths for the first time in France. Uh, and then we, right. we crossed paths again. I invited you to Luminos at Clicker Expo in, uh, uh, a few years ago in, 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 in the UK. Um, and I'm just, it's always a pleasure to talk to you. And especially, I, I, I believe you, you, you've come up with some really unique and great solutions uh, for dealing with reactivity. And you also take a very, a very calming, practical, kind approach to training, which, which I really, really appreciate. Um, I'm curious, one of the things that I think is remarkable is you came out with the behavioral adjustment training, the BAT protocol, quite a few years ago. And over time, you adjusted and modified. I would say you, you learned from your experiences and, and that's what led you to BAT 2.0. And BAT 2.0 really bears only a little resemblance to the original BAT. And I, I thought that was very brave of you to you know, put out a protocol and then a few years later come out and say, hey, you know, I've learned some things and here's a better version of that protocol. Um, what was that journey like for you? I, I just think it's fascinating. I, I really admire you for doing that and saying, you know, what I did before was good, but I've learned so much more and this is what I do now. And I would imagine it's still evolving, right? Yes, it's still evolving. And so the thing is, I, I'm, a, I'm a scientist, I'm a teacher at heart. And so anytime I have something new, then I wanna teach that. Like I want people to have the best practices. So it would, it would feel completely incongruous to say like, here's this old technique and I'm gonna keep, keep teaching that, but I'll be doing this other one myself. Um, and it was definitely a shift for people because, you know, people, they learn something and they like it and they're like, this is working and, and, and I want to keep doing it. And so for me to say, but actually there's this other variation, this new way of doing it that I like even better. It's, it's more organic. It's, it's easier to teach. It's, it's easier on the dogs. And, um, and so there was a little bit of a shift for some folks. Other folks were like, yes, bring it, I, you know, whatever you've got. Um, and so it was really nice to be able to come out with this new variation, which largely was based on questions from people, right? So I would, you know, get questions as to like, why are you doing it this way? Why is your leash, your leash so short? I was like, well, I don't, I don't know. This is the way it's always been done. And so always, you know, using client and student questions as a way to, to get better. Yeah, I think it's, it's, it's fascinating because I think most of us who teach, if you look at the way you teach a topic, it certainly evolves over time, uh, but it's very different when you've published a book. It's there and people have it in their hands. And now they say, but you said, uh, but I don't think that there's anything wrong with that. We are always learning and we are always evolving. And uh, um, I, I would imagine you probably are at a point now where you're like, gosh, do I have to, to do BAT 3.0? <laughs> or, 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 or. I'm like BAT 2.5 now, yeah. 
So I'm like, oh, it's the time. But um, yeah, I actually required uh, Dogwise to put in the contract for the book that I would be allowed to update it on an annual basis if I wanted to. So, so far I haven't really needed to like fully, you know, dig in and change it, but, um, but I, I'm I, I need curious, if you, if you do go in and do just minor updates, does that change the title? Does it become 2.1 or <laughs> what do you do? I think minor updates, probably not, but yeah, once it becomes something that's like, don't do the things and, you know, largely like the yellow original bat book, I just, I don't want people reading it unless they're reading it for historical purposes. Uh, it's not the technique I want people doing. So, um, no, I, and I, I always recommend that. And and when when you first came out with that 2.0, I often listed both books. But in the last four, last three four years, I don't put the first book there. It's it's sort of, it's not it's not necessary because, the the new book really has the things that people need to know. Exactly. I kept all the things that I wanted in there. So, and. I think maybe something that would be sort of clarifying as to why I am how I am is so I grew up off the grid, like no electricity, no running water. We did a lot of things ourselves and we like the house was always under some sort of construction. We didn't have like a finished house that like looks like a certain way and you count on it. So I think the that gives me an ability to pivot, uh, which worked out really well in the pandemic, actually. So. I can imagine it did. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. One, of the, one of the things that's interesting is uh, I recently watched uh, uh, a webinar that you did on, on leash handling skills. And it was like, oh my goodness, this is new. This, this wasn't in BAT 2.0. I mean, you've always, first of all, I, I, I guess I'd like to know or explain why you focus so much on leash handling skills. I, I, it's clearly important, but but why is it important for those that don't think about leash handling and don't recognize it as being an important aspect? Why is leash handling important? Well, for me, the, the leash is, it's there for safety. It's there for uh, making sure that the dog doesn't get too close to the trigger if we're working with aggression. And, but the, the way that we often use the leash is overly controlling the animal. And so my work is really about teaching people how to still have that safety and that sense of control while, while giving the animal a sense of freedom and feeling as off leash as possible. And for example, today on my walk with my dog, like this is the leash. So it's super light because you know she's 18 pounds. She doesn't need a, super, a heavy leash. And without the leash handling skills I have, I wouldn't be able to use like a paracord. It would give me a rope burn. And so by learning how to manage the leash, it helps the dog make better choices and it keeps our relationship um, better. So, yeah, and I, I think that's, that's one of the things that I really took away from when I first watched you speak in the UK, I, I really became aware of that aspect of, of what you teach in that leashes are so often thought of as yes a safety tool but they're often thought of as a control tool and i love the way you use it for safety but you really teach people how to still give the animals options that 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 cord is not there to to control the dog it's really there just to provide safety and you still want to allow the dog to have choices of their own and i i really appreciated that mm -hmm. and and i would say so i watched uh, when i was in brazil I forget his name, but there was a speaker who was talking about how he went to uh, the Czech Republic or, oh gosh, where was it? Anyway, somewhere in Europe where there's a, uh, a bunch of off-leash dogs and basically no humans around. And so he observed them uh, for you know, a couple of weeks and figured out that, that space and time are what make it so that those dogs are not fighting with each other, right? They're navigating that. And the link for me was that's exactly what we do with BAT is we help dogs have the space and time to be able to navigate their environment in a better way. And then over time, as they learn to navigate it, then they get more efficient at that. And they don't need, you know, hundred feet, they need 10 feet to be able to, to use those same set of skills. And so by being able to handle the leash in a way that doesn't force the dog into situations that they're not comfortable with, then they can learn what to do. I love that. I love that. Well, one of the things I wanted to do is is talk a little bit about this these new leash handling skills uh, that you used. You sort of got from from rock climbing, right? Tell me a little yeah. bit about it before we get into demonstrating it. 
Sure. So, I, so I'm a rock climber, and I uh, I usually climb roped almost a lot, a lot inside actually these days. But basically, there's a when you do rock climbing, there's the climber, and then there's a belayer, and the belayer is the person at the bottom who's kind of holding onto the rope. They're not holding the rope per se because they would get rope burn, but they're holding on to the, to the rope, letting it out so the climber can feel as free as possible and not restrained. And, um, and then also it goes through this pulley system essentially. Uh, and then you, you can break it if you need to, like you hold it a certain way and it puts a break on the leash or the, the, the line um, so the climber doesn't fall. And so you're there to catch them. And so then I was, I was walking through um, a store, a big box store recently last summer, and I saw this giant dog collar and it was a collar for a Great Dane. And basically I was like, there's gotta be a use for this somehow. And so then I, I got it and I played around with it and I'm like, well, yeah. And I tried it then with my dog and it seemed like, okay, well, nobody's gonna wanna use it this way. And then it, it sort of percolated more and more. And, and I realized that actually people would want to use this if it was making it so that they could not have any rope burn and sort of bring their dog easily to a slow stop. And then I also came up with variations that don't need the belt um, for dogs that are smaller or for, um, for different situations. Yeah, I, I liked in, in the webinar that I watched you, you demonstrated you were climbing on a rock wall and got really far up and then you, you didn't fall off the wall, but you, you let go and you, you, it was a good demonstration of how easily someone could, could handle that weight. Uh, and, and I, and I thought, wow, that, that really makes sense. So I can see where that might have, uh, might have influenced you. Before we do any kind of demo, I thought I'd comment as everybody's commenting on a couple things in the in the chat window. For those of you who who have not noticed, this is our first time doing closed captioning, and we do have captioning down on the bottom. Uh, we're trying it out. Uh, people have noticed that every time I say Grisha Stewart, it says Gracious Stewart, and they, they thought, well, that's 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 not a bad name for Grisha. <laughs> <laughs> um, so anyway. Um, I'm a little, I, I, I decided that I would like to try out these leash handling skills and, and my leash handling skills are rusty. When I lived in Chicago, I, I used a leash all the time, several times a day, taking my dogs for walks, et cetera. Uh, but now that I live here in Washington state with lots of room, I just let my dogs run out in the pastures and I don't, I don't need to use a leash very often. I've probably put my dogs on a leash two or three times uh, in the last six years. And I realized, wow, it, the skills fall by the wayside. So um, I apologize as we go through this practice session if, if I'm less than skilled, uh, but you can coach me through this process uh, and, and, and explain kind of how it works. And so I'm ready to, to do whatever you'd like, but if you wanna talk me through something or explain the process, uh, uh, let's get started and let's see what I can do. Okay, sounds good. So. There are a lot of different variations and um, I, I kind of wanted to, I know you're set up to do like the more complicated variation, but just so we don't scare everybody by starting with that, is it okay if I talk about the, some of the simpler oh, ones? Absolutely. One? Let's talk about anything that's gonna be helpful to our, to our viewers to understand the process. Excellent, okay. So, um, so basically the, um, the idea is that we've got some, some metal device that's like a pivot point so that that is going to take the friction of the leash and so here's my leash for example and what i have in here is this little tab basically so it's just a little clip that has this is a cool one because it's actually in a circle um, but you've got one there i think i have, well. I have this kind. yeah exactly so you basically just take your leash and then you can just snap it over. Let's see if is that's visually coming through. You just clap, yeah. clip it over. Whoops, this one is not, this is a little easier to demonstrate with. Let me take this. So take the snap and just put it over the leash mm -hmm. like that. And so then it should be able to slide fairly easily. Does yours slide? Yeah. Yeah, it's a, it's a wider leash, so it doesn't slide easily, but yeah, I get the idea, yeah. Got it, okay. So basically then if we, if we wanted to be able to use this, um, you just basically kind of pull back on the handle part and then forward on, 
uh, your other one. Let me stand up and I'll show you what that looks like. And your patience. Okay, so I'll demonstrate this one and then we'll get into really demonstrating the other one that you're geared up for. So I take this extra snap, I clipped it to here. And then basically I can either, you know, hold it like this as a handle or just like this. And then whenever I stop the dog, I just, make it into this really tight V. So if I'm working with a smaller dog, this is really all I need to be able to avoid the rope burn. Um, so, cause normally I would just be holding the leash with my two hands and then just stopping with this hand, right? So, but by adding this other piece, I now have two points of contact. And so it distributes the weight more evenly between my hands and, and then also takes the the uh, friction off. And I would imagine that that some people would think, well, small dogs don't don't aren't going to be a problem. But the small dogs, if they're running or if they're they they can they can put a lot of resistance on, on the leash, right? Yeah, I actually had a client with a pug uh, back in the day uh, when I lived in Seattle uh, at Ahimsa, and she the pug pulled her over. She's like six feet tall, and the pug just like flattened her. So um, it is possible. And then also you can, you know, if you have just a normal leash, you're not going to get any rope burn with a small dog, but if you use a paracord, you will. And so this actually enables you to use something small, like a paracord that you wouldn't normally use, which means less weight on the dog. So well, that makes right. sense. yeah. So, all right. Do you want to switch to the, the big gear version? Sure. And, and, okay. and let me make sure I've got it. I've got it set up, right? I, what I have here is, um, is a, is a 15 foot uh, leash. I have uh, a, a carabiner, but this carabiner has a, a pulley on it, um, which is again, your recommendation. And then there's the belay right here. So talk me through what I need to do. Okay. So, and actually let me use, grab my other carabiner so it's exactly the same kind. There are two here, so I'm using the, I often use the one without the lock, but we'll use this one that you've got because it is the soft, more, most solid. All right, so you've got it where you've already threaded through the ring. Right. Right, and then your carabiner is already clipped onto it. Okay, so we basically want to make it so that, um, the side with the handle uh, is closest to, like that you're not crossing the leash. So if this makes sense. So in this case, then I want, um, I want to be able to pull it out and have it not cross. So not like this, for example, where it's sort of twisted. Okay, so we want to make sure that, that it's, Flat. Let me see what you've got going on there. Great. All right. So I think that should, there we go. Um, yeah, that should work. And so you want basically to clip in exactly as you are um, to your snap that's on your belt, your waist belt thing. And I'll do mine here as well. And this carabiner is a little bit weird because it you have to sort of pull it down to get it to or up and to get it to open. Yeah, I I, I took me a while to figure out how the locking carabiner works. I, I thought it was an intelligence test for a while, but I figured it out. Okay, cool. All right, and let's see. Can you um, is the leash attached to something else on the other end? Not yet. I can attach it to a chair. Does that? What, let's is do that. that. Yeah. And then just for the folks out there watching, so I've got mine accidentally twisted. And so I'm just gonna rotate everything. So it's the other way around. All right. 
I've got it attached to a chip. Okay. All right. And so we want to gather up all the extra leash. So I usually gather it in like a figure eight pattern. Okay. One on either side of the hand. And for this, the purposes of this exercise, we'll let you gather it however you want to. Um, and so the part between you and the chair, make that relatively tight and gather everything else on the other side. Exactly. Oh, lost my belay ring. There it goes. Ah, so if that happens, what you're basically when you're gathering, so the belay ring will kind of fall down, and that's not a big deal. When you're gathering, just focus on starting from the handle out, gotcha. and then that will keep it from. Uh, it'll just bring the belay loop uh, back with itself. All right. Cool. Nice. Um, and then go ahead and make it all the way snug. So using your left hand. Oh, no problem. Yep. And your right hand, you can put it on the leash between you or like between you know, exactly where it is. Yep. So, and then uh, you want the thumb to point away from you. Yep. Okay. Uh, or uh, let's see. Oh yeah, it is. Perfect. All right. And so when you, if you were stopping the dog, you're basically just going to pull the, the whole leash back toward you. Yep, exactly. And do you feel like you can actually, of course your chair is, is gonna roll across the ground. Mine's attached to a, uh, a door, so I can fully lean in. Um, can, yeah, that's I, the basic. I can lean quite a bit. Nice, okay, cool. All right, and then go ahead and stand back up straight again. Um, let's try walking away from it. So just let some lines slide through your hand, um, but keeping it, keeping a hand on it, yep. And then reel it back in, maybe uh, walk straight away from the camera. Yep, exactly. So that's that's the idea. And then let's practice reeling it back in again. Uh, and when I do this, I try to keep it off the ground just so the dogs don't step on it. So it's good to practice that way. And keep both hands. Let's see. Yeah, exactly. I basically very rarely will touch the part of the leash that's between the carabiner and the dog. Most of my handling is going to be on that side. Yeah. Okay. Gotcha. Yeah. Cool. It's, it's interesting for those that haven't done this before. It, if you're not used to using a belay ring, it's it it flows through it fairly easily, but you kind of have to get used to how how it works. I'm I'm just getting used to that now. Yeah, you're doing great. Cool. And then in terms of safety, this is uh, so I'll show you another piece for that. So in terms of safety, if the dog were really strong and they were pulling away from you and you wanted to be able to make it so that the dog could, like you're not trapped, right? right. Most of the time people don't wanna let go of the dog and this is that's the whole goal, but sometimes you do. Um, and so it's good to know that all you have to do is just keep, is just push this ring away and the leash will just flow oh, yeah. out of this whole situation. That. Yeah, it's it it flows really easily when I push the ring away. Yeah, and the whole leash, even the handle and everything, should come out if you do it that way. Oh, really? Yeah. My hand is a little too big. Your handle is a little too big. Oh. Yeah, it's huh. got a, it's got a, it's got this this. Maybe I my belay ring is too small, but it gets stuck right there. Ah, uh, okay. Gotcha. All right. Well, then you're trapped with the dog. Um, so, so can, That's okay. I, I would rarely want to let my dog go if I was in the city. Got it. Um, so if someone were concerned about that, so I'll just I'll just bring that up for the for the record. Um, so if someone were concerned about that, two ways to deal with that. One is to just take the handle off of the leash so it does flow through. Um, the other is. Um, that you can get a, um, it's called a panic snap. That's for uh, horse training that you, if you push it, then it'll disconnect as well. So, Great. cool. Well, um, I can, I, I'm really surprised by how much control this gives me. I can even feel it with my chair. Cause it's nice. 
That's great. So yeah, um, and now just for safety, I also, I usually try to make sure that um, the leash isn't in loops. So like right now, if you've got it like this, if yep. the leash were to pull out of your hands or you know pull quickly, um, you could get it accidentally around your fingers. So you don't have to do this right now in this demo if you don't want to, but usually I try to make it so that the leash goes like in one side and out the other, like a figure eight. I think for purposes of this demo, I'm not going to try that because I will tell you that I have done so much work with, with, with leashes that I'm really comfortable with this and I'm able to let it go really, really easily because that I'm, sounds great to me. I've yeah. done a lot of practice, but I understand what you're saying. Cool. All right. Great. Um, do you want to try it with the dot or do you have more questions? Uh, no, I, I, I'm not sure. I'm, I'm not sure. Well, yeah. I, my only thing I think if I bring my dog in here is he will be very interested in, and he won't, there's no, nothing distracting him that will cause him to pull away from me. He's, he's just gonna stay right with me, I'm pretty sure. But let's try it anyway. I'm gonna come off screen for a second. Okay. Right. What we could do is um, toss some treats around so he's sort of going around the room finding them. That's true, that's true. Hey, so one, oh, go ahead. No, I'm just calling him in. Okay. So one sweet. thing I like about this style of, of handling the leash for a bat is that um, now I have two hands uh, or I have an extra hand available, right? So normally right. with bat leash skills, I'm using two hands on the line all the time. Um, but this actually lets me reach into a treat pouch um, and give treats. So that's that's one of the reasons I do it, even for a smaller dog. Right. All right. All right. So I want to practice this. What, what would you suggest I do? He's I've got the whole setup here. He's of course very attentive to me. Yeah. So your I would say your first step is probably to practice letting uh, being able to let it out quickly. So um, basically uh -huh. tossing a treat away and then being mindful of how the leash is going out. Yeah. Exactly. And you're always pretty much going to keep your leash on the your hands on the part that's um, uh, both on one side of the carabiner. Yep. And I see what you mean. I, I didn't bring it in fast enough, so his legs caught in it. So I need to be paying attention to him. Yep. And um, I'm actually going to interrupt you on that piece. So if that happens again, just use a treat to lure him over the leash so that um, he doesn't get his paws picked up. Excellent. Which I'm sure you've conditioned, but I always, it's like a reflex for me to have it be the dog's movement instead. That makes sense. All right. I'm going to try that again. Hey, here's some treats. Ken, I'm so glad you're doing this. You're so brave and I appreciate it. And then be ready to reel it in. You're gonna be needing your right hand. Right, yep. There we go. Excellent, nice work. And now here again, I have let him get. Excellent. I'm, right. I'm, I'm really glad that he is stepping over because it gives me a chance to talk about that to everybody. So yeah, that's, that's helpful, helpful. All right, good. No, that, that makes sense. I, the, the, big, the big thing for me is learning to reel it in fast enough because he comes back to me so quickly. Can I try right? it again? Yep, let's do it again. Maybe like three more times with that. Here we go, buddy. Oh, sorry. Out there. I, it, it, the belay caught him and he stopped. It, it, so it does work, unfortunately. Good boy. I'm going to try that again. Are you ready? Here we go. Okay, it's great. Nice. Go. And when I'm coaching folks in person, a lot of times what I'll do with this is also um, I'll be the dog so we can practice this shortening and lengthening without um, any stress to the dog as well. Yep. So go ahead and walk around him so the leash doesn't. Perfect. Nice. And you're doing exactly right to back away because that makes it so the leash will stay off the ground and your hands don't have to move as quickly. Yeah, I, I realize that. That's yeah. good. I like that. And right. I feel I feel comfortable in terms of the amount of teaching at this point. But if you wanted to learn more, we can keep going. Um, maybe no, I, think, I think it's good. I, I you know what I would love to do is see if any of uh, the of the people watching have any questions before we 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 run out of time. Uh, Juliana, do we have anybody who has questions for Grisha? Oh, do we have questions? We sure do. I, I knew we would. Okay, so Phil is wondering: Is this a, is this safe with giant breeds like Great Danes, et cetera? 
So I've had people do this with giant braids. So I, I feel that it should be. Um, I haven't personally worked with a, um, with a giant breed, but I've worked with a really, really fast dog who is about 90 pounds. And so I feel solid about that. In the beta testing, I, I asked people from around the world with their big dogs to test this for me. And so we went through lots of iterations of, nope, that's not safe. Nope, not safe. <laughs> um, until we found one that was. So... Yeah, and I would, I would comment that just based on my limited experience, I've worked with big dogs, and I am really surprised at, at how much control this, this gives and how easy it is to hold. So I would imagine that it would work well. Thank you. Yeah, and uh, I have a, one of the people who tested was with, a, she had a Doberman uh, who, they, she had all kinds of different gear on the dog, and so we were able to get less gear on the dog and more gear on her which gave him a sense of freedom and can you know, improve his behavior as well. So I, I feel this is one way that we can say to people who are using a prong collar, for example, to be able to control their big dogs. One thing that we can say, you know what, you actually don't need that. You can use this other gear. And they can't say that this is inhumane for the dog because it's on the human and it's our choice to do it. Um, and we can bring a dog very gently to a slow stop with this. So I do I'm recommend glad. watching the full video to get the whole thing. And it was a really good video. It was it, it was it was about a two and a half hour webinar, but it really answered a lot of those questions. And I'm really glad you brought up that aspect of those that have big dogs that say, I need a prong collar to control my dog. This really helps solve that problem because it does really help with the pulling, which I really like. Let's let's see if there's another question, Juliana. I think we have time for at least one, maybe two quick questions. Um, so one quick question, how do people access that video that you're talking about, Ken? It's, it's on Grisha's sure. website. And, and I think it, in just a minute, uh, we'll have uh, Aaron or Rachel, we'll put it on the, uh, in the chat window for you. Wonderful. And then we've also got a lot of gear questions. Where is the best place for people to find the appropriate leashes and gear pieces for this stuff? So, uh, couple of places. So climbing stores are great for that. I'm actually working on trying to carry this carabiner and the, the ring that we just tested out. So I'm in, I'm in consultation with the climbing companies to get those tools. Um, but if you look at the, the effortless dog training webinar on my site, it also shows like, here's all the rings and the measurements. And because people are from lots of different countries, so you won't necessarily have REI climbing gear in your country. So no, I, 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 once I, I, I watched the webinar and Grisha sent me the list of things that I needed, I was able to get all of it uh, either on amazon.com or uh, at an REI store. There we go, yep. Okay, and by the way, I can catch a person who's like 150 pounds falling straight in the air, like using this. So just so you yeah. know, it's, it's pretty robust. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty impressive. Hey, do, I think we probably have time for one last question, Juliana. Okay, Mara is wondering, what are some pre-training leash cues that you train to prepare a dog for this type of leash handling? Uh, honestly, I, I usually don't do a lot of pre-training with it, um, I, but I do train for attention. And as I'm working, I train for things like easy. So whenever I am about to do a slow stop, I can say easy. And that gives a dog an indication that I'm about to bring them to a stop so that they have a chance to do it without the leash at all. And of course, all of the, you know, the regular, um, you know, heel training and those sort of things I'm doing, but we need to walk a dog right away. And so this is often something you can put right on a shelter dog and say, here we go. So. Oh, this is great. 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 This has been really wonderful information. I cannot believe that we are 40 minutes in already. I am hopeful that uh, maybe if, uh, if I can talk you into coming back again sometime in the future and we can have more discussions about, uh, about some of these really great techniques for, 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 for dealing with reactivity, for handling, leash handling, for whatever. I, I, I really think you have uh, uh, a lot to offer our community and I really appreciate you being with us today on Life from the Ranch.